With an ever-increasing demand for potassium due to increasing crop yields, there is a need for a better source of potassium with improved availability and uptake potential. Alpine K-Tech is the most plant-available form of potassium and is able to enter the plant quickly and easily. As a foiler application, K-Tech is tank-mixable with many crop protection products, thereby increasing the grower's resource use efficiency. K-Tech offers balanced fertility and an added energy source for the plant. The latest development of premium crop nutrition is doing a lot more with a lot less for your crops. Learn more at www.alpinepfl.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to part two of the episode, Farming is Risky Business. It is, isn't it? Absolutely. Or can be. We're trying to change it. No, I think it, I think it is. It is. Yeah. And uh, I think I was to joke with, that's why accounts and farmers are, um, are a funny combination, because <laughs> they're kind of on um, two opposite ends of the spectrum of, right. of risk and risk tolerance is... I think accountants in general and as a stereotype and profession would be low tolerance to risk and then you have farmers on the other side of the spectrum which would be incredibly high tolerance to risk so um True. anyways good point that was clever <laughs> so in part one of the episode we just took a look at where we've come from in the economy farming yep. a few years back 2019 and where we're at going into 2020. So in this episode, we want to look at the risk management tools that can help protect our farming operation. And I want to spend a good chunk of time because I know you have a list, a good a good list of them and we're going to go over them one by one not touch on them too deep because for you guys that tune in weekly we're going to actually be diving into a, a good number of episodes on each of the different topics that we're going to be talking about so peter i'm happy to have him and he's gonna be touching on them introducing them and yeah take it away okay I think I'll maybe just take a step back for a second um, and you know some of the things that we talked about in the first episode but I think that really important thing is is that um, and we talked about yield trends and some of the things that are going on in pricing is that is that the risk profile on grain farms in in Western Canada certainly in Manitoba but in Western Canada as a whole is changing whether producers rega- realize it or not okay um, and I think that that's really the important piece to take home is that uh, if we continue to use the tools that we've always used, is that there we are just inherently taking, you know, as, as producers and the producer I work with, we're just taking on more uh, production risk than we had in the past. Okay. And which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's a thing. Okay. Um, and so it might mean, it's, it's the reason why that we're seeing, um, well, I think two reasons. One is that we have seen some changes to agri-stability um, in terms of what it covers. So I think that that has an impact. But then also because of this change that's happening is that we're starting to see some of these uh, uh, private companies that are are coming into the insurance space and offering, you know, looking to solve a need for farmers, right? They wouldn't be there if there wasn't wasn't a need. Um, and so I think that that's just is, is one of the reasons. And so um, it's what I always tell producers when I speak with them and meet with them is that your risk profile is changing from a production standpoint, regardless of whether you think it is or not. And so... Um, it's important then to look at the tools to understand them and then why it's important to to consider you know how we're going to manage it so i'm glad you went there can do you mind diving into that a little bit you just said your risk profile is changing right no matter whether you know it or not can you just elaborate a little sure so if if we go back to think about those yield trends is that in i think around 2004 that the red spring wheat yield trend average was 40 bushels an acre so if you were taking crop insurance uh, and you took 80% coverage, then uh, 80% of that would be 32 bushels, right? Right. So then you've got an exposure of eight bushels an acre. If you take that same yield trend for red spring wheat, is that we're approaching 60 bushels an acre as where our yield trend is, right? And this isn't target, this isn't what top end is, this is just where the trend is. So if, our, um, if you take 80% of that number, then we're at 48 bushels. So now your exposure is 12 bushels an acre. It's a big difference. Right? So it, as I said, it's just, it's changing. It's not bad. It just is. It, it's the reason why that we're, I think that we've seen crop insurance come out looking for ways to try and make some changes to that, to some crop insurance programs because of that reason is that um, 
if there's more exposure, it also means that they're, the producers need more yield loss before they're going to trigger a payment. That so so um, I, I think that's just, as I said, an important thing to keep in mind. And then the backstop that we had in anchor stability has changed, right? Anchor stability used to uh, trigger at 85% of your historical margins now. It's gonna. It doesn't trigger till seventy percent of your historical margin. So, okay. those are are things that are happening and, and the changes that are taking place. That's actually some big changes. For sure. Yeah. It, yeah. That makes sense. Why the, why we're seeing some private companies come in to kind of fill. I'm gonna say fill. Correct my wording. Fill. Top up. Work with. Yeah. Some of the other risk management tools. Is right. that correct? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. So. Well, um, I've got a list of, uh, I don't know, I won't count them off, five or six okay. products. So we'll we'll just go through them and, and try and go in, um, I think, order of um, understanding from producers, I guess, in terms of what, what there is. So I, I guess the first one would be crop insurance that we'll start with. It has been, you know, historical risk management tool for producers. Uh, in Manitoba, you can... Uh, it's basically a 10-year average. Historically, it's been a 10-year average, one year removed. So you get okay. your 10-year average um, that doesn't account your previous production year. There's some uh, changes within that, in that as well. But basically, then you can ensure that whatever that average is, you can ensure 50, 70, or 80 percent of it. Okay. Um, you sure it on a by crop, a crop by crop basis. Uh, so it allows you could trigger a wheat uh, claim on your wheat and not on your canola. Um, there is a whole farm insurance product called Crop Coverage Plus with uh, with crop insurance that allows you to take a basket approach so you get basically get whole farm coverage. Okay. Um, but crop insurance comes out with their premiums. Uh, they've just started to come out now. They say this is the price that we're going to cover you for, for the year and here's your yield coverage. Uh, every producer has a, it's called an IPI. Um, so their, their coverage for their area is adjusted based on how their historical performance has been. Um, there's uh, 15, I'm going to get that number wrong, but it, there's a number of disclaimer. different risk areas. Yeah, disclaimer. <laughs> All numbers in here. We should just guessing. have a disclaimer <laughs> yeah. right at the bottom. <laughs> exactly. Uh, there's there's different risk areas in Manitoba. Um, so for instance, Brandon, uh, you know, Brandon is, is, you know, risk area two or four or six. If you get down to the southwest corner, it's one. Uh, my dad farms in risk area 12, so okay. our bro dad and brother farm in risk area 12. So there's lots of different kind of risk pockets. And then within each risk area, there's different land components that come into play there. So I think it's a pretty well understood program uh, for Manitoba farmers. There's a high, I, I believe that Manitoba has the highest participation rate of farmers. Um, I believe that it's somewhere north of 80, 90%. Oh, wow. Uh, that is what I was going to ask you. Yeah. I was curious. I was curious if most farmers took it. Right, and and so I think in Manitoba, it's just it's it's considered a very good program. It's relatively uh, inexpensive to get for a lot of crops. Some of the newer crops, not as much. Like corn, your co your cost of coverage on corn is, you know, fifteen eighteen dollars an acre. Okay. Whereas um, you know wheat and canola is generally around, uh, you know between probably between four and seven dollars an acre for most producers. That's a big um, difference. Yeah, I, I, I saw one producer, he had, I think his canola coverage was 80% coverage cost him, you know, less than four dollars an acre. Okay. So it, again, it just depends on your history. Um, and there's some other intricacies that are built in there, but that's kind of the, the, the crux of the program. Okay, so that's crop insurance. Crop insurance. The second one uh, I'll talk about is Agri-Invest, which is the new NISA. Uh, for right. producers that are in NISA and kind of that was the uh, understood it well. So Agri Invest is just a government matching program. I think it's got to the point now where a lot of producers don't even think about it as part of their risk management plan. It's just really just a government matching. You know, they put the money in, they take the money out. Um, but it's it's a percentage of your, uh, it's called allowable net sales. Um, and so it's, it's basically a calculation every year. There's a cap for every producer at $10,000. So you put $10,000 into your account, the government will match it and then you can take it out. Okay. Uh, some producers use it as specifically set it aside and use it as part of their risk management strategy. Other ones just use it as part of their general cash flow of their of their business. That's what we've done. We've made sure that we don't touch that. That's kind of, we call it our emergency fund. Right. We just put our money in there, government matches it every year. It's an absolute no-brainer. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and, yeah. and so there, it's interesting though, because you think that it's, everyone knows about it. And yet we met a, I met a producer this year that's farmed in Manitoba, um, for a number of years and didn't realize that they could be an agri invest. So there's still are producers out there. Yeah. Um, if you are, I would say if you are selling any type of, of farm product, whether it's cattle or, um, if it's cattle or, or grain, then you should be an agri invest. Even if you're a small producer, uh, the paperwork is not significantly onerous. It goes with your tax return. Um, check it off, do the work, get the money from the government. It's a no brainer, you know, and I think you're right. And that's why I do episodes like this, but you look at it, we're 2020. We're also overwhelmed with information. Farmers are busy producing their crop. It's hard to keep on top of all these things. Exactly why I do this yes. show. And to me, it's funny. I'm a farmer mm-hmm. and the government will match me dollar for dollar for a certain amount according to farm income as you said right yeah, yeah. net allowable sales or i believe it's allowable net sales i may be getting in trouble here it could be eligible net sales disclaimer disclaimer <laughs> but it, it's a it, basically a calculation based on the sales it, it's your sales minus uh purchase of allowable commodities is, okay is what it okay needs. excellent so anyways, no brainer uh, yeah. sum that one up um the third one is agri stability and um, gets a little more complicated yeah, I, a little I, bit here. I, I think so, and and I think um, there's a lot of misunderstandings about agri stability and, and when it, it would work. I guess first of all, it's a whole farm product, and I'll come back to that. Okay. That's a pretty important component. Um, is it's it's a whole farm margin based product. So what that means is that it it looks at your um, your revenue numbers. Uh, it adjusts for your opening inventory and your closing inventory. Right. Um, and then it looks at, so it, it accounts for changes in that, and then it accounts for changes in allowable expenses. And so your allowable expenses would be, uh, you know, big ones, seed fertilizer, chemical, uh, your crop insurance would be in there, and then fuel and labor. Uh, I think freight is in there also. So those are your main things that are covered. So what that does is it gives you a, it gives you a, um, a production year margin, you look at your history, your five-year history, you take your high year and your low year out, and that gives you your reference margin. Okay. And so then every year you just look at how your production margin compares to your reference margin. And so uh, each year your, your coverage changes depending on how your five-year history looks. And so you'll have your good years and your bad years coming out of your, um, out of your historical margin. Uh, the way that it's currently set up now is that you need to, um, if your production year margin drops uh, more than 30%, then your agri stability will start to kick in and will it will pay you 70 cents on the dollar of the loss before that. So essentially it means okay. that the first 30% you've got to cover, and then once you hit the, once your production margin matches your reference margin, then below that, then it's essentially a 70-30 cost share. The government will cover 70 cents on every dollar of of your loss below that number. Okay. Uh, it is a whole farm insurance product, so that's important and is, um, I think the frustration of a lot of mixed farmers is that they, is if they've got cattle and they've got grain, then and those two things, if they're really good at diversification and managing that risk that way, then that, it, it, it claws back some of the benefits that they get from agri stability. That would make sense. I often wondered why farmers would be frustrated with that program. I didn't get it, but you're right. Those would probably yeah. just continue maybe to balance each other out. Right? Yeah, just depending, right? If, yeah. So it, you would need to have a bad cattle year and a bad grain year all in the same year in order for you to to trigger. I think there also is some challenges within the beef industry as well. Um, if you go all the way back to that agri stability came out, or I think it was the case program at that time came out in conjunction with uh, BSE, kind of at the same, not in conjunction, but at the same time as BSE. And so what happened was, is because it's margin based and it's based on your history, some really bad years in cattle, cattle farming oh, yes. that had no margin. Yeah. So, um, if your margin is zero and your, uh, 70% of zero is, is still zero, right? Yes. And so I think that that's, is some of the challenges that certainly seen it if we look at different sectors than within the beef sector because they do five-year average you said yeah okay. so if you have so the flip side also if you have five really good years in your history yes really profitable years then your margin is going to be higher if you have five years of really high prices high yield and high prices 
like we've seen, you know, we talked about the trends before is that we've had a, a relatively good stretch here. So our margins are actually higher. So um, whereas crop insurance is, is strictly yield based, um, is agri stability then is yield is margin based. So it's yield and price, right? So it would account for if we saw a significant reduction in prices, then that would count uh, then, then that would count as, as being an impact that you could be covered for through your agri stability. Program. Well, for us, and I won't say numbers, of course, but we've done agri stability, oh, I'd say a good handful of years now. And of course, you, I guess it's, you, it's like any protection insurance. You don't want to have to trigger it because it means right. Things aren't going great, right? But that's why it's there, right? And yes. I think producers get frustrated because they don't get payouts. But that's good. You don't, right? And right? And, and I think that that is absolutely because yeah. if you're in an agri stability payment, that means that you've already lost yeah the thirty percent of your margin. And if we think that most producers are probably, uh, I would say, ten to fifteen percent is what their profit margin is on their overall revenue then that means that you've already lost ouch yeah you're already 30 percent short of your of what your historical margin is right so you're already in a pretty big hole by the time you've triggered your extra yeah. and you know i'll put myself out there because i always i'm good with sharing information mm -hmm. to learn but we've been in the program and in manitoba in our area we've had three tough years for hay has been very dry and we've had to buy a lot of hay, we've had to sell off some animals because, well, why are you going to feed yeah. them if you don't have feed and prices are low, whatever the case is. And for us, in our situation, we've had two years where we've had two really good payouts. Really good. I won't give the numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it by far covers the cost entry, the accountant, probably for a very long time. And that's great that we got that money. It's not so great where we came from to get the money, but you know, the good thing is that protected us, we got that payout, and now that, for us, we took and used that to buy hay. Right. So, again, to me, for our cost of entry, yeah. it's a no-brainer for our farm. Uh, and this will be um, kind of an, well, I don't know if it's unsolicited or not, but a plug, I think, for, for M&P and then other, other accounts that understand agri stability very well is uh, it, it, you should be working with a, a, an accounting firm that is able to predict what your payment should be out of agri stability. Um, it, it's not a, uh, th there are some intricacies within the program that make it tricky, especially if you're changing, you know, if you're growing, you know, if you keep adding acres, um, there's a structure change calculation that comes in there, or if you're radically changing your operation, then there can be some, some other intricacies. But it's really just a, um, it's just math, right? And so uh, it's more than just the information you have to give to the um, uh, give to the government. Uh, certainly at m &P, we have people that all that they do is agri stability. That's their job. And so behind the scenes is that we're actually gonna run your, um, your inventory and your production flows to make sure that they match and that they align and that things make sense. So that when your application goes in that we have a, a pretty high um, probability that that what we expect your payment to be and what your payment's actually going to be is going to be going to be reasonable. And I think that there are there are other accounting firms certainly out there that work with a lot of farmers that have similar expertise. But I think it's important that um, that if you're getting help with it, that you understand that that's uh, that that is out there and that you should be able to understand the program. Because there's people that say, well, you know, it's it's complicated and we don't understand it. Uh, obviously, it requires could require hiring a professional. But it, it's just a matter of understanding um, your production and the flows and then how it works. I will give you guys a shout out. I wasn't going to because I try and be neutral, but you guys are a very large accounting, agriculture accounting firm, and we use you. Shout out to Henry that does my agri stability every year, and he's fantastic. But exactly that, I, it is well worth the money that we pay. I'm a big believer in hiring people for their expertise, right? And in the long run, you pay more. I know that, but I always believe it pays off. Going with the cheapest product, if it breaks and you got to replace it four times, you're probably cheaper off buying the more expensive one. 
And that's the way I look at it too. And I've heard people that say, oh, my accountant doesn't even talk to me about this. Well, here's the awareness. Yeah. We're sharing the information. Find an accountant, Myers Norris Penny, or somebody that specializes in these programs and get some help with it. They get it. It's, it's well, not that easy. No, but I think it's, it's it because of the number of, of applications that we do is that we can have people like Henry or like Gwen that works here in our in our Brandon office that focus specifically on agri stability, yeah. right? So all the agri stability applications in Winnipeg go across Henry's desk. All of okay. the applications. I didn't realize that. Yeah, all of the applications in Brandon uh, go across Gwen's desk here, right? So that they can specialize, that they understand, that they know the questions that um, you know, because we all produce to get those questions from the government and that they, you know, questions and they, they don't have time to answer them, but yeah. we will know what the questions are gonna be before, we'll ask them before they do. I get one call a year. <laughs> I'm surprised my phone's not ringing right about now. And it's Henry, Tracy, what's your inventory? We'll get it to you. Yeah. And then he takes care of the rest. For and, sure. And it's lovely. And, and so I, I think that that's, Obviously, it's, it's, you know, out of the programs we're going to talk about is the one that as a, as a firm that we're the most involved in. Okay. But I think that it's important. It, it may not be the fit for all farms that are out there, but I think it's, a, you know, just as any of these to understand why they, they work or why they don't work for your farm operation. Is there something to also be said about having a commitment to a program? I might be off, but if you are just going to dive in, you might be on the side where you've had good, correct my details, but where you're not likely to trigger a payment, like if you're committed, you're committed, don't go in and out, yeah, does that I, make sense? Yeah, I think that I think that in all of these programs is that they're, they still are basing it on your historical information. So if you're trying to pick and choose, um, you know, from one year to the other, which one works and doesn't work, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that, but just also understand okay. that you know, if you say, well, I'm just going to pick and choose when I can go in agri stability. Um, number one, you've got to decide ahead of time. And number two is you're going to have to do all the work anyways, because we need your five years of history to, in order to create your reference mark. So okay. we're going to have to go back. If you think it's bad getting a call from Henry now, but what your inventory is, think about if you get a call from Henry, say, Hey, what's your last five years of ending inventories? Can you just, uh, we had that the first time and I wouldn't want to yeah. do it again. So, okay, anyways, yeah. I digress. Yeah, so that, that is agri stability. Um, the next one uh, I've got is private hail, which I think is, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, to be honest, it's probably the program that not, I know the least about, but I think, again, producers are pretty comfortable with it. Okay. Um, there are some hail options through um, uh, crop insurance as well, um, but basically it's a single peril, so it only covers hail. Okay. Um, and then also, um, it's field specific. So whereas crop, so agri stability is whole farm. Crop insurance is by crop. Hail insurance can be by field. Really? Yeah. I didn't actually know that. Now I know that there are some some other things that are in there that you can you know regarding your deductible and um, and when it triggers and stuff like that. And and I don't know all the details about that. But basically, it's you know we we take hail insurance. We get you know if we get hail then then we get a payout. Okay. Um, I'll talk about when we we talk a little bit more about some of them working together. I'll I'll make sure to to come back and talk about that and in, in crop insurance. Um, so the other two then on kind of the production risk management side would be some of the private insurance products that are out there. Um, there's really two of them that are are the the most popular, which would be Just Solutions and Gars that are both um, Saskatchewan based or Global Agri Solutions. Okay. Um, I call GARS, um, is that they would be the two most popular and Global Agris would be the bigger of the two of those. They're being around a little bit longer. Um, but they are kind of in a nutshell are, are margin based products similar to, in a way, kind of more similar to agri stability than they are to um, crop insurance. So it's a whole farm insurance um, and they're going to cover you for your, uh, for your input costs and then a margin above that. Uh, so it's based on your, again, based on your history and your area. Um, and then you can pick your insurance based on what you, on, on what level of coverage you'd like above your input cost. So if you, if you were looking at um, GARS as an example. Just Solutions is a little bit different. I don't have as much familiarity with it uh, just because they aren't um, as common in Manitoba. Um, 
but it still is kind of margin based looking at what your expected, you know, again, what's your expected margin for the year and what percentage of that then we can cover. Uh, within GARS, there are, um, well, there's probably 30 different options. That uh, might even be an understatement now. Wow. I didn't recalculate okay. it. I think at one point it was 24. I think now it's probably, it could be north of 60 different options within the different tools options and good. options <laughs> and packages. And options are good to a point. Uh, highlight the book I'm reading right now, which is called The Paradox of Choice. Oh. Or that I've been, I shouldn't say reading, I've been kind of working my way through it. Um, that maybe choice is good to a point. Then it can be overwhelming. Then it can be certainly overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there are certainly a number of different options that, that tailor themselves together. Um, some of the changes that that agri stability has come out also uh, impacts that as well. And I'll talk, I'll park that one for right now until we get through the list. Okay. Um, so those are, are kind of the main ones that we think about when we think about risk and, and um, when we talk about risk management tools. But we really, there are other pieces that come into that as well, right? So these are production side, we can talk about market risk, right? So obviously we talk about forward contracts, we can talk about using options. Those are two, options are really insurance, our price insurance um, that there's a market for and that it's traded on. So those are certainly things that we have to use. And then on the financial side also, there are other tools that we have. Um, the uh, the cash advance, the canola growers, or mm -hmm. canola growers would be the most popular, but other um, commodities that are out there that offer cash advance programs, those are certainly things, are risk management tools that we have, okay. uh, right? If you think yeah. about it, you know, right now we have all this market uncertainty. You don't even think of it that way, right? I, yeah, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sell my grain right now, but I'm forced to because I've got my um, FCC bill that's due in, on the 15th of March. Well, a cash advance, if we use that, so right. we could use that to help manage our cash flow risk and then which changes our perspective on, on the marketing side. Yeah, I would have never even, I would even lump that more in financial management in my brain the weight, but that is right, cash but that's, risk. Absolutely, and, and so they all tie themselves yeah. together. Um, you know, our financial structure, working capital, my favorite thing to talk about um, is, <laughs> do we need to adjust our financial structure and make sure that we've, you know, our working capital. So our working capital is basically our own money that we're, that we've got invested in our operation to help in the day-to-day -day with the cash flow component. Okay. So do we need to have a better financial structure that allows us to um, that allows us to manage our risk elsewhere? If we have no debt. Uh, no debt, wow. wow. Well, I like the sound of that. <laughs> One producer that's out there. Um, but then I would go out and buy more cows. Exactly, so then right? Have debt. So then you'd have debt again. And more land. Um, yeah. but, but as our debt level changes, then our tolerance for, so our debt level changes, so our financial risk increases. Right. So then does that force us to manage our production risk more or less, right? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So if our debt level goes down, can we afford to take on more production risk because we have less debt, right? Because our financial situation yeah. is better, right? And lots of conversations with producers about, should we be in crop insurance? Maybe I can self-insure. And okay. um, that certainly is an option, but understanding that insurance is a law of probabilities. The example that I always give is that, you know, Brandon had two 100 year flood events in three years, wow. right? In 2011 and 2013. So um, if you can afford to um, weather that storm, exactly, pun intended, <laughs> <laughs> then, then maybe self insurance is an, is an option to go down, right? But okay. then how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna make sure that we've got the financial structure in place that we can afford to weather that storm? Okay, so I really like that point and that makes sense. If you have no debt, you can weather the storm, pun intended, a lot better than a younger producer that is leveraged pretty heavy, right? For, for sure, yeah. Okay, that's an important point. Yeah, and so I think that as we kind of tie that into then how do these insurance, like do these, how do they work together? is obviously we focus a lot on, and even the work that we do in our risk management analysis, it focuses very much on the production side and the production component, um, but it really involves all those other options. And, and so maybe the solution is that it is okay to take on more production risk, but then we've just got to manage our risk a little bit differently from a financial structure side, or that we need to be, you know, change the way that we manage some of that risk in, in the marketing side. And I think just looking at more of a holistic um, component yeah. to risk management. And, and that's really, I think, what 
what's important is, is understanding that, you know, as I tell clients is that number one is that you are not your neighbor, right? So the financial performance of your business is not the same as your neighbor's is, even though that you think it is. Um, and then the secondly is that your tolerance for risk, you know, whether you're, um, you know, I talk with a lot of farmers about, you know, that are, you know, in their forties and say, you know, her, her risk tolerance is changing, right? And when it I started is. out, actually, it yeah, does. right. When they started out, they had nothing to lose. So right. their tolerance was, was quite a bit higher, right? So now their tolerance for risk is, is significantly lower. It's so funny you say that. I've been noticing that. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. And, and so I think that that's, um, I think that's from a bigger perspective is it obviously, uh, you know, as we, as we dive down back into some of those insurance components is understanding how they work together and don't work together is important because there's really no point in us buying, um, in buying insurance twice if they're going to cancel, if we're only going to be able to claim on one. Okay. Right. For example, I just got uh, bumped on my way back from vacation on my flight. I had to claim through my travel insurance. I've seen that on Twitter. Yeah, so I had to claim through my travel insurance. The first question that they ask me after they get my information is, do you have other insurance? Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because they're somewhere in that policy somewhere, it says that we're gonna, you're not gonna be able to claim twice on this. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Right, and so I think that the same applies, especially if we kind of come back to those core components, is that, um, you know, crop insurance and hail insurance are maybe a good example to start with is that you can buy, those two things work completely independently of each other. Right. Right? Yeah. So uh, in a way there's no over, there is overlap, um, but they don't, they don't claw each other back from each other, right? So you can get a hail insurance claim and a crop insurance claim uh, at the same time and essentially cover, uh, if you've got a 100% hail loss on all of your wheat, as an example, you trigger a hail claim, but then you also would trigger a crop insurance claim. Okay. Now the question then that I would ask is, do, is that good? Like, do you need, are you then overinsured? Okay. There's such a thing? I, I think for sure there's such a thing because, um, is risk is, risk is the opportunity. So if we completely eliminate the risk, then we are giving up our profits, right? Like we're paying a premium, giving up our potential profits to limit the downside exposure to our business. Right? It is. It's kind of almost like gambling a little bit. I'm, <laughs> or not. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going to go with that analogy. But like you said earlier, when we were chatting prior getting ready, you said if we're working on $50 an acre profit and everything that you insure is coming off of that. Yes. So you're giving up profit to limit risk. Exactly. So right? we can, if, if just as an example, if our risk management strategy is going to cost us $25 an acre and our profit is, is $50, then our opportunity is our expected profit is 50 then we've limited that now to 25. See and that's so now, what I mean it's kind of like gambling. Am I going to gamble so I make more but am I Yeah exactly and so what we're trying to do is find that 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 equilibrium point that says we're, we're willing to invest us us this amount that's going to you know this percentage of our profit essentially that's going to limit that downside risk but still give us opportunity to to still hit some profit targets and so okay. Um, you know, one of the challenges is, is, is coming back to these things that work together is that agri stability and crop insurance, as an example, is that agri stability will count your crop insurance payment. They'll deduct it from any money that they're going to pay you. Okay. Right? right. So it is possible to trigger a crop insurance payment and not trigger an agri stability payment. Right. Now it also is, you can say, okay, well then, and this comes to how these things work together is do I, should I change my crop insurance coverage if I if I lowered my crop insurance coverage, how much of, of what I lowered would agri stability pay, pick up, okay. right? And so again, how do those things work together? One of the changes that we saw this year with, with agri stability is that any private insurance products, they're not going to claw back their payment out of, uh, out of the agri stability payment. So for instance, um, if you were to trigger a private hail or a, um, or a GARS payment, as an example, is that agri stability is not going to uh, is not going to reduce their payment because of that. They just kind of ignore that income. Exactly. Okay. And so what it allows is, is, um, that's good because you kind of get, but they take. Yeah, exactly. So what way. it does is it reduces overlap, yeah. right? So it reduces that, that situation where you're be paying for insurance, paying for your agri stability and paying for say a GARS or a, a private hail insurance. And they would, 
um, where they would cancel each, where you'd only be able to claim one of them. So you're paying premiums on two that you're only going to be able to claim okay. with one. And so I think that that's where there's certainly been a lot of interest and a lot of talk, certainly on the crop side now, is that is that there is an opportunity to, so we can ensure around our agri stability margin. And understanding that agri stability is still a relatively cost effective insurance product, so we can keep that in place and then just look to fill in the gaps. Okay. And so be a little more targeted in terms of how we put our insurance uh, our insurance strategy together. Okay. That sounds very strategic. Smart. Okay, so is that that covers pretty much all the different tools and a bit on how they work together? Yes. Okay. So I think that wraps up our part two, and we're going to be right back with part number three, what's right for my farm. See you guys soon. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.